Dear God, we thank you for the beautiful music and for the people who can play instruments and lead songs and sing. <clears throat> the one song we were singing about how we'll understand it better by and by, I pray that that's the case, Lord, um, of, of all things having to do with your kingdom and even including this study of the Old Testament book of Leviticus, which is a challenge for us. Lord, uh, please do protect us against mistakes in our thinking and uh, I pray that everybody's heart and, and mind and soul will be in a state while we're here studying the Bible together, which is pleasing to you and builds us up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we recently began a new study of the Old Testament book of Leviticus. Last week, we finished chapter 2. Yeah, and tonight, we're, tonight we'll cover chapter 3. But actually, tonight, I want to cover three topics in addition to just reading chapter 3. Um, these are summarized on the on the slide. Last week, several people were very interested in the subject of of leaven, or yeast. Um, why that was not included in the in the grain offerings, and I thought it would be good after listening to the video recording of last week's class. It'd be good to go back and pick up the threads of that discussion and um, see if we can eliminate any confusion that there might be. Also last week, somebody asked me if we could start this week by touching on uh, the reason why salt is added to the grain offerings. And the salt there is referred to as the salt of the, of the covenant, something we didn't discuss much last week. And so I plan to do that also. Then we'll go ahead and read it and study chapter 3. And finally, time permitting, um, I want to just quickly answer a question that was raised several Several weeks ago, I think it was before the end of the Mark study, <clears throat> somebody asked, when did the chapter and verse numbers that we see in our Bible come into existence? And I, I didn't know the answer at the time. But before I forget the question, I thought I'd come back and answer that tonight too. All right, so without further ado, let's begin by talking about leaven. And tonight, more than I do in some weeks, I have some verses up on the slide just to make the discussion easier. <clears throat> the topic of leaven, so-called leaven, arose last week from our reading of, of Leviticus chapter 2. If you look in chapter 2 of Leviticus and kind of follow along with me, I don't have everything I'm going to talk about on, on the slide, just one key verse. You may notice that the adjective unleavened, not leavened, appears in verse 4 twice and again in verse 5. So we have unleavened, unleavened, unleavened in verses 4 and 5. And each time the, the word unleavened is used, it's used to describe one of the three types of cooked grain offerings which Leviticus provides for. You remember two of them were baked in an oven one of them sort of smashed against the wall, the other, the other one a, a whey first smeared with oil, and the third one was like pancakes, you know, in, in a metallic griddle. Those three were described successively as unleavened, unleavened, unleavened. <clears throat> I noticed, interestingly, in preparing tonight's review, that no mention was made of leaven in verse 7, which, which speaks of the fourth type of grain offering, the one where you put it down in a pan in oil, with, with a lid. And I don't know whether that's because leaven is not an issue for when you cook grain that way. Maybe so. Because leaven is more of a baking connected kind of a thing. And the, the first three kinds are more like baking. But as I made the point last week, and I, I think this is true and I'll continue to make this point, when we read something like Leviticus and we see a pattern and we expect the pattern to repeat, when the pattern breaks, it's always a good reason to stop and think, hmm, why, why is this being treated differently than the other th thing? All right, and so this, 
This may not be a strong example of that, but it's an example to illustrate how you have to read something like this. When you see something that's odd or exceptional, the, the Spirit of God may be trying to make a, a special point. All right, so then those are the, the, the cases of, of unleavened. And then in verse 11, which I have up on the slide, the noun, leaven, it's a thing, a noun, appears twice, and I've underlined those on the slide. And it's in verse 11 where we get the strong general prohibition of burning leaven and also honey as a food offering to the Lord. No grain offering that you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall burn no leaven nor any honey as a food offering to the Lord. And it's surrounding this verse mainly that our discussion of leaven kind of branched off in a few directions last week. So let me come back and do... Do, do a kind of study of leaven here for a second. The Hebrew word that's being translated leaven here in the ESV, it's also translated as leaven in the King James Version, also in the Revised Standard Version, the only ones I checked, but I presume most of the top class modern translations will translate the word as leaven. NIV is an exception. NIV translates this as yeast. And yeast is probably not the best translation here, as, as we'll see, although it doesn't badly mislead anyone. <laughs> yeast, as you may know, is a fungus. It's a single-celled fungus. Right? It's microscopic. You can't see it with your eye, but you can see it in a, in a microscope. And when yeast goes inside a bread dough, what it will do is it will start eating the sugar in the bread dough. It'll metabolize the, the, the sugar in the in the, in the bread. And as it does, it's a kind of fermentation process. As it does, it will release two things, alcohol and carbon dioxide gas. And it's the carbon dioxide gas bubbling up through the bread dough, which causes the bread to rise. And so after the, the, it, this process of rising has taken place, you can put the bread in the oven and bake it. And, and leavened bread is big. It's filled with, with air, finally, at, caused by the carbon dioxide gas, which is bubbled up while, while you're baking the the bread. Yeast is not the only substance that we know about that will cause bread to rise. In modern times we have baking soda and baking powder. I think they had nothing like that in the time of Moses or even in the time of, of Jesus. What mainly caused bread to rise then and what mainly ca causes oisy bread to rise now still is yeast. And also some other bacteria called lactobacillus, which you find in bread, especially in the U.S. we have sourdough bread. I don't know if, if that's common everywhere, but sourdough bread has yeast, but also lactobacillus in it. And the thing, first thing, so I guess we all have this basic understanding of what leavening means. And one point we have to make is it wasn't until the microscope was invented in the 19th century that anybody knew what yeast looked like because you couldn't see it without a microscope, right? So when the Bible is talking about leaven, it's really not talking about yeast the way we think of yeast. You can actually go to the store and buy yeast because modern technology lets us isolate it and package it and sell it. But in those days, they didn't even know that yeast was a thing really small that you couldn't see. Right? They could have only, you know, understood that bread somehow magically, you know, would, would rise if you left it out long enough and in a certain way, just like wine somehow magically would turn into alcohol if you left it out in a certain way. They learned over time how to, how to, how to, how to, how to do this, right? And so what they did, because they couldn't go buy yeast, was they would let dough sit out, and the yeast from the air and bacteria from the air would, if they were lucky, go into the bread naturally. And finally they'd notice that it's rising. And when they realized that they had active... They just, I don't know, modern people call it like starter material, but, you know, bread that's already infected with, with yeast and, and, and bacteria. Then they take part of it and let it rise and bake a loaf, keep the rest, and then the next time that you bake bread, you use this one. Mix it with fresh flour and water and honey and salt or whatever you're going to mix it with, and then bake another one. And so each bread comes from the, the, the previous bread in, in, in that way. That's how they had yeast in the leavening 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 material. I, I read someplace that 
miso started the same way in Japan. Like every, every mother's miso soup tastes differently because the miso paste grows a little bit differently in each house because the bacteria is a little bit different in each house or something like that. I don't know if that's true. I read that somewhere. All right, so anyway, leaven, when, when we hear, see the word here, is a kind of lump of contaminated stuff infected with yeast and, and bacteria, which you can use to take a piece of it, put it into fresh makings, and make, make bread. The other thing that's important to understand so that we read the biblical passages rightly is something about time. I read on the internet that if you have a good starter batch of, of, of dough that's infected with yeast or whatever, that it takes between 4 and 24 hours for a loaf to rise before it's ready to bake. If you have no starter material, the lady I read on the internet says it can take days and days before the, the bread will naturally accumulate enough yeast and bacteria and stuff to, to be ready to, to use in this way. And the point is, leavened bread takes a long time to make. So if you're reading a story and angels show up and Moses says, go bake bread, Sarah, she's probably baking unleavened bread because she doesn't have four to 24 hours to wait for the bread to rise, even if she's ready to, to, to bake bread anywhere, right? So, so there's this, this timing, timing issue we have to keep in mind when we read biblical passages. Okay. And they probably, I've said this already, but they probably would have understood without our sense of microorganisms, but they probably would have understood that somehow the bread was like almost alive. That leavening had some magic, some property that would, if you put it in, with other material that wasn't leavened would suddenly become leavened and make bread that could rise. And so it was like probably a really amazing thing to them, just like wine making and some other, those two processes, you know, were probably the most impressive ones to people who didn't have a microscope and could understand, you know, fermentation in, in, in some way, right? So anyway, <clears throat> that's, that's what we're dealing with here when we talk about leaven. And leaven is clearly like other things that are active in that way. It's not a stable material. It changes, it grows, it spoils, it affects other food that it comes in contact with. You know, it's, it's, it's contagious. It can infect and contaminate, you know, other food. And, and it's supposed to, otherwise it won't, it won't work. Okay. Now what we read in, in chapter 2 last week made it clear. God made it clear through Moses. <clears throat> God doesn't think there's anything wrong with leaven. He doesn't think there's anything wrong with leavened bread. He doesn't think there's anything wrong with honey. He doesn't think there's anything wrong with leavened or unleavened bread with honey on it. None of these things are bad. They're not unclean. They're part of God's good creation. All of them are enjoyed, enjoyed by, by, by people freely. The only point being made in Leviticus chapter 2 is when you're getting ready to make this kind of grain offering that's being talked about there, the kind of bread that you're supposed to use is unleavened bread. That's, that's the, the, the point, right? And so the question becomes, and became last week, why? Why is it important to use unleavened bread for, for this sacrifice rather than, rather than leavened bread? What's the significance of that, okay? And so you may get tired of leaven before I finish, but tonight you'll never, you'll never have to talk about leaven again. Let's, let's go into the Bible and see. So the very first time the word leaven appears in the Bible, as far as I, I can tell with my computer, is in Genesis chapter 19, verse 3b. Right. You, you should open up your Bible to Genesis chapter 19 and look what's going on there. <clears throat> if you look there, what you'll see around the passage that I've cited is this is the story you may hopefully all remember where a couple of angels come to the Sodom where, where Lot is living with his family and Lot is worried that the townspeople will molest the angels and he, he persuades them to come stay at his house and when the angels get to Lot's house he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread and they ate. So the first bread ever fed to angels in the Bible was, was, unleavened, was unleavened bread. And it, it could be, as I said before, that because the preparations were hurried you could have only had unleavened bread. There just wasn't time to bake bread. But I can't swear to the angel timing and all of that. It, you know. So what I have to say is the Bible mentioned it explicitly for a reason. 
there's some reason why the Holy Spirit why, and, and why the human author of, of the book of, of Genesis wants to make a point that this bread was unleavened. So there's something special about unleavened bread, even there in, in chapter 19 of, of Genesis. And then just a few verses earlier was the story I remember last week. This tells of the time when Abraham encountered three mysterious angelic figures. You can read about it in chapter 18. Just flip back one chapter from Lot. And Abraham quickly arranges a feast and he screams. I imagine he screams at Sarah, you know, hurry up and bake bread. And he goes and takes an animal to slaughter and he makes a feast for these three angelic people. And considering how hurriedly that meal came together, I would almost have to to be certain that it was unleavened bread. I don't know how Sarah could have baked bread in the time available. But the word leaven is not mentioned here. So I apologize. Last week, I remember this as the first story of leaven in the Bible, but I was one chapter off. I, I mixed Lot and Abraham's two similar stories together. I did, as they say, conflated these two stories. And learn from my, learn from my mistake one thing before we move on. In the New Testament, some of the New Testament authors conflate Old Testament stories also. For the same reason. They're old men. They have the Bible stories in their head. They don't have a Bible handy to read. And so they'll do that sometimes, right? It'll, it'll confuse you sometimes when you're reading elsewhere in the Bible because people don't always keep their stories straight. Anyway, my point here is very early on in the Bible in Genesis, we have some stories that, that may suggest that unleavened bread is special angelic holy heavenly it's what you feed to angels when they when they when they come when they come to visit and let me tell you something else i figured out on my own the fact that you have to specify unleavened bread means that leavened bread was ordinary common you may think oh they only had unleavened bread in those days according to my quick search on the internet people have been baking leavened bread since at least 5000 years bc People know a lot about winemaking and bread making for, for a really long time because that was like mainly what they had that they enjoyed to eat and drink, right? And so the Egyptians were baking bread and other ancient civilizations were baking bread for a really long time. In the, in the manner that I said, by taking bits of dough from the previous batch and baking the next one. Now, of course, the main example in the Bible, in the Old Testament, of where leaven takes on a, a huge significance, and all of you guys were pointing this out last week, was the story of Passover, right? Everybody knows the story of Passover, I think? So, you know, Moses is leading the, the people out of captivity in Egypt. All these plagues are coming against Egypt. The next one that's coming is that the Lord is going to send an angel to strike dead all the firstborn male children or something. But to protect the children in Israel, God has a special arrangement. They're going to slaughter a lamb and spread the blood on the doorposts. And when the angel passes over, he's not going to bother the, the children of, of, the, of the Israelites. And that was the beginning, sort of, of their final exodus from Egypt. And so God instructed them right at that time and many times after that, they have to annually celebrate the, the feast of the Passover. And when they do... They eat the flesh of the lamb that they've slaughtered, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter her herbs. They shall eat it. This symbolism is, is smack dab in the most important episode of the Old Testament and repeated every year, taught to children when they're young. So if you're a Jewish reader and somebody says unleavened bread, your brain goes immediately, Passover. Right? It's, it's a very strong symbol for, for them uh, or jog to, to, to their to, to their memory okay and some people think the prohibition against honey that we also read in Leviticus is because the whole Passover thing is supposed to be bitter herbs you, you have a picture in your mind of people who are packed up ready to go no time to break bread nothing sweet to take the bitterness out of the herbs or to grow garden vegetables you know you just got unleavened bread and the, and, the, and the Passover lamb, and that's what, that's what you've, you've, you've got. Right. And conversely, leavened bread and honey will evoke images of the promised land to the average Jewish mind, because it's the land flowing with milk and, 
honey, and it's the place where you have the leisure and the opportunity and all the time you want to to bake bread or to pay people, the professional bakers, to bake bread or whatever it would be. But this sacrifice is supposed to be linked somehow to the covenant, to the, to the, the desert experience with Yahweh and the children of Israel in, in, the, in, in the covenant. So all of the significance, theological significance, biblical significance of all the events connected to Passover, which is practically the whole Bible, is a really good reason to require unleavened bread in the sacrifice that God describes in chapter 2. It brings all of that with it. It brings the, the offerer's mind into the covenant space, right? In, into that very important story. And we know centuries later, by reading the New Testament, we know that Jesus and his disciples celebrated Passover. And when they did, without a doubt, during the Passover celebration, they obeyed the Old Testament rules requiring the eating of unleavened bread. But, but I'm also quite sure at other times, they ate ordinary leavened bread. And to this day, all Jews at, at ordinary times eat ordinary leavened bread. But during the Passover and perhaps at one or two other special times, they'll eat unleavened bread just to remind themselves still of what happened when God brought them out of Egypt and established a, a, a covenant, covenant with them. I guess, for example, when the little boy brought seven loaves to Jesus and Jesus fed 4,000 people, they were leavened loaves. They weren't unleavened. The Bible doesn't say so, and there's no reason to, to expect that they, that they would have been. So there's nothing wrong with leaven. So what about, my point, I'm about ready to turn to the New Testament. The Old Testament tells me leavened bread can be special symbol in a certain circumstance, but unleavened bread is fine too, just, just not for this, right? But what about all those scary stories in the New Testament that people were remembering last week? I, I look at those too. I looked at every word, time the word leaven was used in the Bible, right? So... In Matthew chapter 13, verse 33, is the first occurrence of the word leaven in the New Testament. He told them another t parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. That a woman took and hid three measures of flour till it was leaven. So surprise, surprise. The first use of the word leaven in the New Testament is positive. It's like the kingdom of heaven. Leaven is like the kingdom of heaven. And this is Jesus speaking here. So Jesus teaching his disciples say, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. And how is it like leaven? Because it's hidden, it's invisible, and nevertheless, it can change everything. And that's like so many other stories Jesus told about the pearl of great price and all of that. Many, many stories in the New Testament by Jesus are about the hiddenness of the kingdom of God and how suddenly it's there upon you. And so the first use of leaven in the New Testament actually says leaven is like the kingdom of, kingdom of heaven, right? If you're a person who reads your Bible that way, you know, sort of li literally, this should set you straight. It can't be bad if Jesus says it's equal to the kingdom of heaven, but Jesus didn't read his Bible that way. And, and that's kind of, the, kind of the point of the next one here. This is the one people remembered. In Matthew 16:6. 6, Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus was teaching something in that chapter, if you remember. I quoted this from Matthew, but I think it was in Mark also when we studied it recently. And here, Jesus' disciples were making the mistake of thinking Jesus was talking about bread and leaven. They were talking to themselves in the boat. What's he talking about bread, blah, blah, blah. And Jesus said, are you so stupid that you think I'm talking about bread and, and leaven? And so he corrects their thinking and helps them to understand. And later in chapter 16, then they understood. He did not tell them to beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the scribes. And so Jesus is using leaven as a metaphor here. First he used it as a metaphor for something good, the kingdom of heaven. Now he's using leaven as a metaphor for something bad, the teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees because it is a very powerful figure of speech. It's an invisible, almost magical thing that makes bread rise by touching some, the leaven, right? The leaven can cause that to happen. All right, and so <clears throat> that's, that's, the, that's the sense of that. And 
the, the most difficult use of, of leaven in, in figurative language in the New Testament, in my opinion, is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where the Apostle Paul is teaching. And if I was a sissy, I would skip this one because it is difficult. But because it's difficult, we have to at least look at it quickly. So here Paul, look, look in 1 Corinthians, maybe you should read verses 6 and 8 also. But here Paul, using this metaphor, says, Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, <clears throat> as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So Paul is talking to the Christians in Corinth. If you've read Corinthians, you know the pro all the problems that they have. He's talking to them, and he's saying to them, you guys should cleanse out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. But then he quickly observes, ah, actually they are a new unleavened lump already. Why? Because of what Jesus did on the cross. So within the larger context of chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, the old leaven, I think, refers to the sinful practices that were going on in Corinth and to other inclinations that they had, particularly pride and arrogance. In that same chapter, Paul says, your pride doesn't do you any good, your arrogance doesn't do you any good. This person who, the, some guy is married to the wife of his father or something, and that's, that's, a, that's a, a sexual sin. And Paul is saying, you should cut out the old leaven so that you may be, be a, a, a clean lump. These things should not be permitted in the church of Jesus Christ. Why? Two reasons. One is, it's just... Should, shouldn't be. Jesus died on the cross to, to, to wash you clean from these kinds of sins and to set you free to sin no more. How could you possibly allow that old leaven into your, into your new lump? That's one reason. The other reason is a danger that if leaven gets in there, it's possible it could spoil the whole church. right? And so Paul is mixing his metaphors together here in a fairly complex way, but he's at least using it the same way that we've seen in the New Testament with leaven as a, as a metaphor for something that can spoil something, something else. But Paul's also pulling in the Old Testament symbolism by considering the Passover lamb as a metaphor for Jesus Christ and what was accomplished with the Passover lamb and the spreading of the blood with what was accomplished by, by Christ and he, the intersection of these two uses of leaven is, he says, you should cleanse out the old leaven because that's exactly what happened in Egypt and that's exactly what happened in every house in Israel that observes these laws to this very day. When they left Egypt, they cleansed out the old leaven. Why? Somebody said because they were in a hurry. That's true, but I realize that's not the main reason. The main reason is all of their old leaven had Egyptian bacteria in it. They were making bread that had risen up from the tradition of bread baking in Egypt. Now they're going to leave Egypt. This is a new thing, and God wants the old lump removed because it's a new thing that's coming, right? And the unleavened bread signifies the change from the old leaven to the new leaven. From, you know, from, and, and the same thing with the celebration of the Passover. I don't know if you know if you have Jewish friends that observe Passover, but for like one week or whatever before the Passover, they search their whole house looking for anything that might be leavened so they can remove it. And the symbolism is the same. They want the old things to be dead and, and the new things to, you know, to, to, to come, right? And the bread symbolizes that because bread, the way they made it then, is a continuity of living bread bacteria from, you know, day by day by day by day. If you want to break the chain with history, you got to set your bread back to zero. Zero again, <laughs> if I can, if I can say it that way. So I'll get off this now, but I'm going to summarize all the stuff I just said to, before we move. All right. So here's what I can conclude about leaven. First of all, leaven is not bad. If you were thinking, oh, Jesus says leaven is bad, that's why they didn't use it for the grain offering. That's not true. That that would be the wrong way to read read the Bible. Leaven is 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 fine. But leaven is a very powerful metaphor, especially to them who knew nothing about <coughs> bacteria or <coughs> anything. It was like a, a phenomenon that they were very impressed by. It's a metaphor for things both good and bad. 
It's like the kingdom of heaven in that it's invisible but finally can affect everything. It's like the teaching of the scribes and Pharisees because it's invisible but it can corrupt everything. It's like the moral turpitude in the church in Corinth. It could ruin everything, right? That's, that's the kind of metaphor it is. It's, in fact, if you had to teach these lessons in those days, I can only think of two really good examples, yeast and wine. I mean, those are the chemical reactions that they live with, you know, and, and so they, they would use them in their teaching, of, of, of course. And then God's command in, in Leviticus 2, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact, is a literal commandment. God is not doing, you know, um, uh, symbolism or analogies or, or, or like that. You know, he, allegory. That, this is not an allegory. God is saying, when you make this offering, don't use leaven. So whether you understand the poetry or not, if you're going to make that sacrifice, don't use leaven. God said so. I mean, that, the, and I'll bet in, in the early days, Moses and the guys weren't talking like we were. What's the meaning of leaven and all of that? You know, they were saying, oh, God said don't use leaven, so let's don't, don't use leaven. It was the rabbis in later years and Christian scholars in later years you know, who meditated on scriptures and started to think about all of these other things you know, that, I've, that I've been, including Paul, and Jesus and the, the New Testament authors, you know, were finally thinking that that way. <laughs> so the use of unleavened bread for burnt offerings is evocative. I mean, it evokes ideas in your mind. And any good sacrament should be like the Lord's Supper, the, the bread and the wine make you think of the body and the blood of, of, of Christ. The baptism makes you think of death and resurrection. The O offering described in, in Leviticus chapter 2 is supposed to make you think, I'm almost sure, of the Passover. It naturally would make you think of, of the Passover. It may make you think of communion with heaven because of the stories with Lot and Abraham that, 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 that we read. And certainly it's an image of spontaneity and freshness. You know, if, if you have to bake bread quickly without relying on the past, without relying on somebody else giving you the, the stuff to make it, then, then you're gonna, it's going to be unleavened bread. And for all these reasons, if you're going to make a sacrifice, a bread offering to the Lord, unleavened bread makes sense. Right? And there may be some practical reasons also. Like I suggested last week, it burns easier and it doesn't get all sticky on the, on the altar. But, but this is what they, what they did. All right, so it, that's it for leaven. Now, quickly bef before we move... Gosh, I skipped over several pages of notes. You guys are lucky. Um, okay, so then salt, uh, salt. Last week somebody said, let's talk about the salt passage. And as we've seen, the grain offerings in chapter 2 must include fine flour, oil, means olive oil, and frankincense. They must exclude yeast or leaven and honey. But finally, the last thing is added, it says... They must include salt. In fact, I didn't have space for the whole verse on this slide, but the, the remainder, the last line, says all your offerings should include salt, which suggests maybe not just grain, but even the meat offerings maybe should, should, include, should include salt. So why are they being told to put salt in, in, their, in their bread offerings? And last week I speculated some practical reasons. One is bread normally does include salt. Otherwise, it doesn't taste good. And most of this bread is going to be eaten by the priests, and so it would be strange to have a sacrament that provided food for the priests that, they, that wasn't tasty, all right? And that's reason enough to put salt in. But withholding salt could also be a kind of ketzi sort of symbol. Salt was valuable in those days, and so if you're going to make bread offering to the Lord but leave the salt out, that's sort of like offering a sick animal rather than, than an animal without blemish, right? Your offerings to the Lord are supposed to be good ones, and so leaving salt in makes sense for that, for that reason. But whether those practical considerations enter in or not, <clears throat> um, you know, again, the commandment to include salt is a literal commandment of God. Understand it or don't. You better put salt in there, otherwise, you know, you're going to have a problem you're going to have a problem with, with God. It doesn't matter if you see symbolism, but here, you don't actually have to wonder about the symbolism. God tells you what it is. Specifically here, God is again speaking in the second person singular. He's saying you, individually you, not you as a group. You, Yumiko, you, Ricky, you, Kazuko. 
He's saying, whenever you're offering, make sure you add, and he doesn't just say salt, he says the salt of the covenant, right? So he's telling you that it's symbolic. What's it symbolic of? The covenant, right? It's the salt of the covenant means every time you make one of these offerings, you're going to be reminded that you must put salt and it's the salt of the covenant and your brain, just like with unleavened bread, your brain goes to the covenant, right? It's, it's, a, it's sending your, your thoughts in, in, that, in that direction, right? And, so it, and, it's, and the covenant has two sides. It's going to take your mind to all of the words that God said that you, as a, from your side of the covenant, have promised you will do. And it's going to take your mind to God's side of the covenant, to all the things God said he would do to bless you. And so your offering has both thanksgiving and praise on the one side, and also guilt and sin and, and feelings of remorse for your bad behavior on the other side. All, all of that will, will, will come to your mind when you contemplate the covenant, the covenant with, with God. You should at least be mindful of who you are and the sinner that you are when you make, when you make such an offering. And I was thinking in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, which is what Pastor Takeshi and Dennis normally read when they do the Lord's Supper here. They'll say, you should examine yourself be before you come to the Lord's table. It's kind of like that. You know, if, if you're going to go make an offering to God, you better examine yourself and remember who God is and, and, and your covenant relationship with Him and how He's faithful and how you're not, right? And, and, and the, all those things should be in your mind when you're going to make this, make this, um, this sacrifice. All right, so the connection between loyalty and this loyalty offering, as one guy calls it, the grain offering, and the covenant is quite clear. But why salt? Why didn't they say the grain of the covenant, or the olive oil of the covenant, or the frankincense of the covenant? Why? They said the salt of the, salt of the covenant. And I don't think there's any, any absolutely certain answer, but some of the things people say is, well, salt is very stable, immutable, pure, purifying. They used salt was one of the few things they had to purify things to keep them from decaying. Very valuable, life-giving. If you live in a desert environment without salt, you, you die. And in Semitic cultures, that is the cultures of the Jews and related populations among which they, they lived, I read, it was very common for men to share a meal, including salt, when they solemnized any agreement or pact or covenant made among men, and they referred to it as the salt of the covenant. So it's possible that it had a sort of common use connotation also that they're now applying in a, in a, divine, in a divine setting. So salt is probably a good, good, simple, uh, good symbol. And one thing I thought of in the train on the way over here, just before I came, is the other thing is, like leaven, <coughs> salt is something that has a profound effect on other, other things, o only not to modify and decay them, but rather to preserve them, right? So it's also good for that reason, because the salt preserves, preserves the covenant. And, and, and one last thought, if it's necessary to put salt in every time you make an offering, what it means is, the people who make the offering are very quick to forget the covenant. They need to be re reminded like every morning and every night and every time they personally make them salt, 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 salt of the covenant, salt of the covenant is reminding them, you know, reminding them of the, 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 the covenant. The New Testament uses salt a bit as, a, as an image. You were reminded to be salt and light and also taught, remember, that if salt loses its saltiness, then it's of, it's of no value. And Israel was supposed to be, the covenant people were supposed to be the salt and the light of the world. The reason why God chose those people was that they would be the salt and the light in the world, right? The reason Jesus came was to be the still greater salt and light of the world. Jesus' disciples are called to be the salt and the light of the world. But if we lose our saltiness, what value are we, right? So anyway, those are the things I can say about leaven and salt. Now, let's steam ahead. So just to remind you where we are, we're, we're in the first seven chapters of Leviticus. It's all about offerings. That's where we are right now. And 
The first chapter was all about whole burnt offerings of animals, right? As, as suggested here. And those, those offerings all completely consumed the animal that was offered. And those, those offerings are understood to, to have an atonement aspect, right? You're substituting your, the animal for yourself. You're substituting the life of the animal for your life. You're substituting the blood of the animal for your blood and, and so on. That kind of, of, of nuance that it has, which will be developed further as we read on into future chapters about how these sacrifices are used. And then chapter two, which we finished last week, also had to do with offerings. And there were many similarities to chapter one. There, all of these offerings in chapter two, like chapter one, are burnt. They're all called food offerings. <coughs> they're all said to make a pleasing aroma to God when they're burned <coughs> on the altar. One main difference between chapter two and chapter one is chapter one is all animals. Chapter two is all grain. <coughs> chapter one, all of the sacrifices consumed, burned up and smoked to God. Chapter two, only a small handful was sacrificed to make a pleasing aroma to God. The rest is given to the priests as their, as their food, which is something that the whole nation, national concept of Israel requires that the priests receive their food from the offerings of the people. And God is faithfully attending to that here. The second one has no, I think, uh, and many people would say, has no sort of atonement concept there. Um, the second, the grain offerings are more a loyalty offering or a, a memory of covenant kind of thing, which aligns with the symbolism that we've been, that we've been talking about, right? It's, and, and usually, as you'll see, both offerings are, are given. So you don't have to worry that you're not covering your bases. They'll make a, a, a burnt offering of a whole animal for atonement, a grain offering for the whole shell, fellowship, celebration, worship, you know, um, kind, kind of a thing. <laughs> and then we already talked a lot already too much tonight about, about what it has to be, right? You know, it has fine flour, olive oil, frankincense, salt, no leaven, no honey. All right, so now we, we read on into chapter 3. And Steve, get your voice, your reading voice ready. <clears throat> so could you read verses 1 through 5 of chapter 3, please? Okay. Uh, Leviticus 3, 1 through 5 reads, If his offering is a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offers an animal from the herd, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering and kill it at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall throw the blood against the sides of the altar. And from the sacrifice of the peace offering, as a food offering to the Lord, he shall offer the fat covering the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins and the long lobe of the liver and he shall remove with the kidneys. Then Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar on top of the burnt offering which is on the wood on the fire. It is a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Thank you. Okay, now with the slides I have up, you know, in, in background pictures are intentionally by me intended to, to, to remind us that we're talking here about groceries. I, I, I mean, the, the, these guys were herders. They herded cattle and goats and sheep. Um, this was food to them. You know, this is what they, they ate. And, and part of it, they offered to the Lord in accordance with what we're reading in, in, in Leviticus. And as I mentioned in previous classes, the offering of animals to God in a religious context is a practice that is so old in Israel and in other cultures as well. So that was a kind of common human notion that, that you might, you know, that when animals die, there might be some religious thing, thing happening. So <clears throat> I, I, I think it's important to understand. I mean, we, we eat, I, I eat meat. 
and I pray before I eat. Um, and the same things I pray are the same things they prayed, and the same kind of meat I ate is the same kind of meat they, they ate. Because of what Jesus did, I don't have such an elaborate ceremony surrounding my, my offering of, of meat and so forth and so on. That's been superseded and replaced, perfected by, by Christ. But I don't think there's anything particularly off-putting or barbaric about what's going on here unless you happen to be a vegetarian, in which case that picture might annoy, might, might annoy you. But it, to most people, the sight of that should say food and the pleasing aroma to God should say barbecue. And, you know, it's, it's a happy... What do you think when you smell, you know, meat burning on the grill? It's party time, right? And, and, and for the offering that we're talking tonight, it was, it was party time. All right, so anyway, that picture is, is intended to provoke that, that thought. So we, we, in what Steve just read, verse 1 says, if his offering is a sacrifice of peace offering, <clears throat> you could literally, you, alternatively, you could say, if someone's offering is a sacrifice of peace offering, or literally is, if the one making the offering is making an offering of, is making a peace offering, this is very different from the way chapters 1 and chapters 2 began. Chapter 1, that was about whole burnt offerings, began by addressing itself to any human being who would bring such an offering. Chapter 2 began with the address that says, if any soul would bring such an offering. Chapter 3 chooses to say neither of those things, but instead, almost not to focus on the one making the offering, but more on, on the offering it, itself, because it says the offerer, you know, it, it wants to talk about the offering without really focusing on the offer as much as chapters 1 and 2 did. Those differences, I'm convinced, in Hebrew, which I can't read, are fairly marked and probably significant, but I'm not certain I understand the significance of them, other than to point out to you that if this seems like boring repetition in English, in Hebrew there's more, there's more going on there. When Hebrews choose words, they choose them carefully, and they chose a different word at the start of chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3 for the three different kinds of, of offerings. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, and so, again, it's, it's, it's anyone, male or female, these are gender neutral terms at the beginning of chapter 1, 2, and 3, it's never assuming that the offerer is a, is a man, although it does seem to be assuming that it's a uh, human being, soul, or the person bringing, bringing the offering. Um, here, the word, although chapter 1 and chapter 3 both have to do with sacrificing animals, the, the word used to describe the offering is different in, in, in Hebrew. The chapter 1 word has, to, to Hebrews for a very long time, the sense of whole burnt offering. That's what the word means. Here the word is translated into English with some difficulty. The ESV translates it as a peace offering. The ESV is following the King James Version and the Septuagint and the Vulgate, so it's probably as good a, of a translation as you're gonna, gonna, gonna get. Peace offering, chapter three is your peace offerings, but other translators have, have said fellowship offering, shared offering, or offering of well-being. And all of these different translations of the Hebrew reflect the practical reality that for all of the offerings in chapter 3, only a small portion of the animal was actually given to the priest to sacrifice to God by burning it up. That's God's, God's portion for a pleasing aroma. But the remainder of, of the meat, as the picture suggests, is to, to be eaten in, in, in a normal way by, by people. And also we'll find out in chapter 7, a bit of it shared with the priest that helps them to do to do the, the, the offering. So in some sense, these peace offerings or fellowship offerings or shared offerings are a common meal involving God, his people, and the priests. So some, last week somebody was saying, is this like the Lord's Supper? Yeah, there are elements of the Lord's Supper in chapter 2. Chapter 3 has even more elements of the Lord's Supper because this is a real meal where, where God is, is a guest there like Jesus was, you know, God among his disciples at, 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 at the Last Supper. <clears throat> and if you read beyond Leviticus and out into the subsequent chapters in, in, in the Old Testament, you'll find out that this type of offering was frequent, the most frequently mentioned anyway in the Bible, festive, important. The, the priests and 
and prophets paid a lot of attention to, to these things. And you'll also find out here and elsewhere that usually it seems like when this offering was made, a whole offering and a grain offering had just been made immediately previously. And so it's like they deal with their atonement issues and their sin issues and their guilt issues and other things we'll read about in future weeks with offerings in the beginning. And once they feel reconciled you know, with God and in the right place, then they offer one of these offerings which they can share in the eating, eating of it. It's, it's a, somewhere in my notes I said it's, it's like an Israeli happy meal. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so digging quickly into the into the details a bit. Verse one looks at cows first, just like we saw in, in chapter one. Only this time, it doesn't matter whether it's a male or a female cow. Chapter one, it had to be a male. All the atonement ones, for some reason, have to be a male. But these ones that you you can share happily, you know, among yourselves, it could be female or male. Either one is okay. I don't know the reason, but reading it backwards from the New Testament, <clears throat> of course, there's more reson resonance with Christ, who's compared to a lot of these sacrifices. You know, if if it's if it's male, maybe. Um, <clears throat> the cow is still supposed to be a good one without blemish. It's still supposed to be offered only to the Lord. Verse two is the same as what we saw in chapter one. It says the person who's bringing this peace offering is the one who has to lay, hand, lay a hand on it. And that person themselves, they have to kill the, kill the animal at the entrance of the tent of meeting. We had pictures up before of the tabernacle inside the courtyard right in front of the holy place, the tent of meeting. This person who brings it would, would, would kill the cow. Then just like in chapter 1, the priest would come, collect the blood and throw it on the sides sides of, of the altar. However, this time, almost all of the Hebrew scholars are saying that the sense of the blood thrown on the altar is different than in chapter 1. In chapter 1, it's atonement. My the animal blood in place of my blood. The animal life, his life is in the blood in, in place of my life. Here, the connotation is supposed to be more the blood of the covenant. This whole thing is sort of resonating with the idea of, of, of covenant covenant between God and his people and his, his priests. And so the blood here might have that image more than it would one of <clears throat> one of atonement. And, I, and maybe if I thought about some more, I'd realize it just has to be that way because most of the offering is going to be eaten by the people and not sacrificed. It, would, it wouldn't be an effective atonement offering maybe by the way they, you, you, you think, about, <clears throat> think about these things. So this is a celebration, a sharing of blessing, a sharing of prosperity. And then verses 3 and 4 are very similar to the grain offering. <clears throat> Only part of the offering is given to God as a food offering. But not just any part. Just like chapter 2 was really fussy about how you were going to prepare the part for God, chapter 3 is really fussy about how you're going to prepare the part for God. The point of fussiness here, I think, is to, to prevent idolatry and magic and sorcery and all the things people <clears throat> you look at all the cultures in history once the priest can start innovating next thing you know this priest has got stronger magic than that priest or this way is better than that way and pretty soon it takes people's attention away from God but this whole tabernacle thing is supposed to be bringing people's attention to God God isn't giving them any choice <clears throat> he's saying you can be reconciled with me my way right Right. And so that's, I think that's where a lot of the instructions come in. And specifically here, what has to be offered to God is described as all of the fat covering the entrails. So if you open up the animal, there's fat on the outside of, their, of the entrails, plus the kidneys and the liver, which you take out together with all the fat on it. That's what, that's what gets offered to God. That's what Aaron's sons will burn on the altar, verse 5 as a food offering with pleasing aroma to the Lord. And please notice in, in verse 5 that, the, that this peace offering is placed on top of the burnt offering, which means that the offering described in chapter 1 has happened first, and then this offering came in and got put on top of it, which is another reason why you, you probably shouldn't be reading this as atonement, you know, and more as a covenantal peace offering kind of a thing because the atonement thing already happened first. 
All right, the atonement. <coughs> atonement for sin. Yeah. Did, did they give any indications uh, of oh, what occasions do you do the peace offering? <coughs> That's chapter 7. Okay. So I, it's, I, I hesitate to jump back and forth. I think it's better to leave the questions open and then okay. chapter 7 we'll talk about how, how do you atone for sin, how do you atone for guilt, and so, so on. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 are saying, how, how do you do, the do these things? Now here, once again, we're going to have the same kind of questions that we had about leaven, honey, oil, salt, and frankincense. Why these parts of the animals and not other parts of the animals? You know, why not their eyeballs? Why not their feet? Why not? Why, why not? Why not? Right? I mean, why not? And so people have talked about this a lot over the years, and here's what they've said. Some people actually point <clears throat> to the health benefits of removing the fat and cholesterol from the diet of the people in Israel. They talk about it seriously. I think it's nonsense, but there are people who seriously look at it that way. Other people, more likely, <clears throat> are suggesting that the fat was especially tasty, and fat burning on the fire meant an especially pleasing aroma to God, and I think that's, that's true. And so... That would be the reason why you'd pick it, because, because you're only going to give a small part to God, but you want to give the part that's best for God's pleasing aroma offering, and maybe these parts will do that. <coughs> Still other people have said that fat, like honey and, and, and milk and leavened bread, are associated with the promised land and prosperity and fat cattle grazing on a hill and stuff, like in David and Solomon's time, but the time hasn't come yet yet for that and so it's not appropriate for them to be eating <clears throat> eating that way and finally a lot of people seriously and these are smart people who may be right but I, I, I can't say say that in the cultures in that time the kidneys and the liver of animals including people were understood <clears throat> to be the seat of emotional life and so they could have had a a, a sensibility for from, for their times that those organs were particularly important, you know, some, s somehow. And once again, I can't tell you, you know, for sure which of those or which combination of those explanations is, is true. The thing we have to come back to is that this is, in any case, a literal commandment of God. Whether you were a poet or a theologian or you understood all this kind of stuff at the time, the most important thing was God was going to let you be part of his community. He was going to be a part of your community. That's the covenant. You are going to keep sinning because you're a human being and he's giving you a way to keep reconciling yourself with him. But you got to follow the rules. And, and these, the, these, are, these are the rules. And, and the largest significance that's certainly true here is the significance of communal meal. All right? So God is involved. The priests are involved. The people are involved. Their leaders are involved. It's, it's ordinarily a happy fellowship kind of, kind of thing going on here. Real quick, Steve, could you first read just verse 6? Verse 6 reads, If his offering for a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord is an animal from the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. Okay, so just like chapter 1, it's not just cows. You can also use sheep and goats. By the way, no birds because birds are too small to share probably. <coughs> um, but goats and sheep are big enough, big enough to share. Um, and, um, and so that's, that's mentioned here. And again, you take them... Whether they're male or female doesn't matter. Um, just like cows for, for cows for this offering. Now seven through eleven, Steve. If he offers a lamb for his offering, then he shall offer it before the Lord. Lay his hand on the head of his offering and kill it in front of the tent of meeting. And Aaron's son shall throw its blood against the sides of the altar. Then from the sacrifice of the peace offering. He shall offer as a food offering to the Lord its fat. He shall remove the whole fat tail 
cut off close to the backbone and the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. And the priest shall burn it on the altar as a food offering to the Lord. Okay, now verse 6, which we read separately, logically applies to both sheep and goats. <clears throat> and starting from verse 7 then, he, he, in, in continuing to the end of that paragraph, he's, he's directing himself to, to sheep. But he's directing himself to young sheep. He says, he says a lamb. And I don't know if, if this excludes the offering of mature sheep or not, but it, it, it speaks of a lamb. I don't know if there's any practical issue here. As far as I, I know, I'm pretty sure it's safe to say people ate both lamb and mutton, you know, young sheep and, and, and old sheep, then and, and, and now. The fact of using a lamb clearly ties this to the Passover. Because if you go to Exodus and you read about the first Passover, it wasn't an adult sheep, it was a, it was a baby sheep, it was a lamb. All the other symbolisms we've seen tying things to the Passover, to the Passover, to the Passover, kind of suggests to me that the, the, this is intentionally um, giving preference to a lamb over an adult sheep just because it's better it's a better symbol and sign of what's being represented here it'll cause them to remember the Passover but I don't I don't know that or whether you'd have trouble if you tried to sacrifice an older an older sheep okay um, once again this lamb can be male or female but it has to be without blemish verse 8 says same stuff laying on of hands killing blood on the altar all's the same as what we saw <clears throat> before verses 9 and 10 as with the cow abdominal fat plus liver kidneys and associated fat of what's burned on top of the burnt offering to make uh, to, to, to the Lord and here the one difference is they mention the tail <clears throat> and the reason why I read somewhere is that palest sheep the sheep in Palestine some of them can have a very fat tail, up to 15 pounds of fat in the tail of a in the tail of a sheep. The ones that get really old, they have little carts that they wheel around behind them to hold their their tail because their tail gets so heavy, and that's a kind of a delicacy. Um, so that would be one explanation for why the tail is involved. But on the other hand, I don't think lambs had a heavy tail, and so there's some. Something here where I don't, I don't know whether God just prefers the lamb, but an, an adult sheep is okay, and if you do, you get his tail, or, or, or whatever, I, I, I don't know. <clears throat> Verse 11 says, all of this is burned as a food offering to the Lord. But here's the most, to me, interesting and puzzling thing. Here, there's no mention made of this being a pleasing aroma to the Lord. It just hit me in the nose. I mean, I'm reading along and I'm expecting that the Lord's portion of every burnt offering is supposed to generate smoke that rises up to the Lord as a pleasing aroma. And when I get to the lamb for the peace offering, there's no mention of it. It's conspicuously, conspicuously absent. And you may say to yourself, and people have, that's probably a mistake. They just, you know, they just forgot to, to write it here. <clears throat> Except if you look in chapter 4, they make exactly the same not mistake. In chapter 4, verses 31 and 35. In, in, in 31, you see them talking about the, the, the goats. And the goats are sacrificed, making a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But then starting in verse 32, they're talking about the lamb again. And when you get down to verse 35... And all its fat he shall remove, as the fat of a lamb is removed from the sacrifice of peace offerings, and the priest shall burn it on the altar on top of the Lord's food offering. No mention of pleasing aroma to the Lord. So why is a lamb not, it is a food offering, it is to the Lord, but why is the aroma not a pleasing to God, as I really want to know. Then it tells that Jesus is also called the Lamb of God. I don't know. It makes me wonder. I mean, yeah, I really, I really don't know. Have the same healing 
So please think about that as I am. And I, I don't think any of my books know either, but I mean, it's, it's a very startling omission that we would have a food offering to the Lord where they don't mention a pleasing aroma. There's presumably a, a, a reason. What it, what it might mean is for whatever reason, God prefers cows and goats be offered um, when, it comes, when it comes to, the, to these peace offerings. And, we, and that's the question we should be asking ourselves. Is there some reason why God would prefer cows and goats to be offered for this particular sacrifice, whereas sheep might be more suitable for atonement or something? I, I don't know. If, if you find out, let me know, because I, I really want to know. And then I'll, I will end instantaneously. Steve, hardly anything new on verses 12 through 17. Can you? I'm sorry, 12 through 17. Okay. If his offering is a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord and lay his hand on its head and kill it in front of the tent of meeting, and the sons of Aaron shall throw its blood against the sides of the altar. Then he shall offer from it, as his offering for a food offering to the Lord, the fat covering the entrails, and all the fat that is on the entrails, and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins, and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. And the priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering, with a pleasing aroma. All fat is the Lord's. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places that you eat neither fat nor blood. Okay, so in what Steve just read, we find out that peace offerings, which is the subject of chapter 3, can be goats as well as cows and lambs. Verse 16, the only thing I would note, but I've already noted it, is that goat offerings, the same as cow offerings, when you take the, the designated parts out and you burn them on the altar, it is a pleasing aroma to God, unlike the lambs, which for some reason are not described as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And then verse 16 <clears throat> generalizes the point about fat. All fat is the Lord's, um, as if to clean up any possible misunderstanding anyone might have through all the detailed descri um, descriptions. It w wants to be made clear that fat anyway is the Lord. And by the way, the commentary said the fat is just the, in, uh, in the, the, the fat covering and the, and the liver and kidneys and the stuff de described, not like the fat that's inside muscle in, in meat. It's, it's, not, it's not like you couldn't have a good steak. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's the extra fat inside the animal that's being translated translated here. Um, <clears throat> and then it, it memorializes this and expands it and hammers on it for all time. Verse 17, verse 17 says, It shall be a statute forever throughout all your generations and in all your dwelling places that you can eat neither fat nor blood. And so this is a, a key point throughout the Jewish food laws until this very day. Um, kosher laws, you know, the people ob observe. Um, for, for whatever reason, it's understood in Israel that all of the fat and all of the blood, you know, can't be consumed by the people. <clears throat> the fat belongs to the, to, to the Lord. The, the blood just can't be consumed by people. Only animals, only animals would do that because the life is in, is in the blood, according to their way of thinking. And we've discussed already some of the possible reasons for that but I don't know the definite answer. <clears throat> Noya, your answer about when do the chapters and verses come into the Bible has to wait for next week. Okay. Already 10 minutes, I'm over. I apologize. I'll, I'll pray. If anybody has questions, then after we pray, please feel free. <clears throat> Dear God, I'm sorry I keep running over time. I know people are uh, busy and anxious to get home. Please do help everybody to get home safely and timely <clears throat> um, tonight, despite the fact we ran over a little bit. And uh, please continue to bless um, our efforts um, to read uh, this difficult book of, 
<coughs> Leviticus and to find there the things that you want us to find there, particularly, Lord, as we keep reminding ourselves to find there things about Christ, things that expand and amplify and deepen our understanding of Christ and what he accomplished for us when he, when he came. Um, by looking at what means of atonement and reconciliation you had provided to your people <coughs> in, in ancient times before Christ would come. Uh, please do forgive us, Lord, for our sins, and we thank you that because of Jesus we can have assurance of forgiveness. We can be washed clean, set free from sin, and actually made able to obey you uh, in ways um, that weren't even imaginable to Moses, I think. We're very blessed to come after the cross and to enjoy all of those benefits. Please help us to understand them well. <clears throat> in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.